Hi, I'm Doug Davidson. I'm the Research and Instructional Services Librarian at Northwestern Oklahoma State University. Today, I'm going to show you how to build a template for an APA style student paper and also how to cite certain common types of sources. So I'll share my screen here. As you can see, I have Microsoft Word open. I recommend that you open Word yourself. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, so feel free to pause the video so that you can uh, do the things that I'm showing you how to do and, uh, and keep up with me there. Now, most people, when they want to start a new paper in a particular style, what they tend to do is they come up here to the font and the paragraph panes. Um, that's actually uh, can be a bit of a mistake and can lead to a lot of uh, troubles and frustrations later on. You may have uh, at some times been editing a document in Microsoft Word and suddenly you start a new paragraph or you hit backspace and it tries to default you back to this uh, Calibri font with uh, size 11. The reason for that is because Word is really designed that you should set up your styles ahead of time on the back end rather than simply editing the font or the paragraph uh, appearance as you go. So what we're going to do now is build a template that we can always have on hand that will automatically have everything we need for an APA style paper right there in it. And then we don't have to mess with those fonts or heading styles ever again. Now, admittedly, this does take a little time to set up. Uh, as I've done this in the past, it usually takes about 45 minutes total to build an APA style paper in its entirety. But uh, that's going to save you a lot of time in the future. Whenever you have a paper that you need to write in APA style, you'll be able to load up this template that we're about to build together. And then that's going to save you a lot of time in the future. It's also going to result in smaller file sizes. And as I'll explain a little later, it's going to produce uh, documents that are more accessible and easier to navigate through. So to begin with, I'm just going to type out a row of text and uh, you can type the same thing on your computer. We'll start with title, name, department, university, class, professor, date. This is all the information that's going to go on your title page and it will become a title page by the time we're finished. Next we'll type in title again. Uh, that's going to be always the header at the, at the top of the first section of an APA paper is always a repeat of the paper's title. Body text, that's just a placeholder here. Body text without indentation. There can be a number of uses for a text that does not have uh, an indentation at the beginning of it. So we'll make that as a style. Heading one, heading two, heading three. Uh, for most papers, you shouldn't need more than three levels of heading, but we're going to go ahead and style all of them. So I'm going to add heading four. Uh, actually, let's do it this way. Some body text just as a placeholder. Heading five. Body text again. And we're going to style a block quotation, which of course is for any quotation that's longer than 40 words. Instead of placing it in uh, quotation marks as you do for most quotations. You place it offset in a block. We'll look at that in a moment. And then type in block quotation, second paragraph. I'll explain that when I get down to it. Uh, references and a bibliographic entry. These are all the basic parts of a uh, APA style paper. Uh, something that I'm not going to discuss today is how to do uh, tables and figures. Uh, refer to your APA guide for further details on those. So to begin with, we are going to uh, set each of these in a particular style. You'll see that everything that's, we have this normal box highlighted. Everything is in normal style by default, but we're going to change a few things there. First, uh, we're going to put the title of the paper in title. All of this stuff, which goes on the first page, we're going to choose the subtitle style. Uh, title is going to be a level one heading. Body text, we're going to leave in normal. Body text without indentation, we'll get to a little bit later. 
heading one is going to be another heading one, of course. Then heading two, heading three, heading four, and heading five. Uh, body text block quotation, we're going to set that in a quote style. Block quotation, we're going to set in this intense quote style. And I'll show uh, why we're doing that a little later. References, that goes at the top of the separate page at the bottom. For the moment, we're going to set that in heading one again. And then bibliographic entry, we'll make a special style for that when we get to the bottom. Now, what we've got right now, these are just the defaults that are set up in Microsoft Word. Uh, this doesn't look very much like an APA paper. So what we're going to do to make it look like an APA paper <clears throat> is start uh, adjusting all these styles to look the way we want them. So the first style that you always want to set first, and this can be easy to forget, is the normal style. Again, normal is default. That's what we're going to use for most of the text throughout the paper. So we'll start by adjusting that style, making sure it looks the way we want before we do anything else. And the reason we want to do that first is because all these other styles are based in some way on normal. So if you adjust these other things first and then adjust normal, that can have unexpected changes. And then you'll have to go back and adjust things yet again. And that can be really frustrating. And that, that may be one of the reasons that people don't like to mess with the styles pane. So if I click on this little button kind of hidden in the corner of the styles pane, that's going to bring me up this menu. There are two buttons that are particularly useful to use down here. There's one that's new style as to create a new style. We'll do that a couple of times here. We've got a few new styles to make, but also manage styles, which allows us to edit the styles that already exist. There's also this style inspector. Play around with that if you like. I admit I've never found very much use for it. So with a normal text selected, we will choose um, manage styles. We'll select this button here. I'm going to move my picture down into the lower corner so I'm out of the way there. Uh, we're going to select modify. See normal, following paragraph is also normal. We know that we want this to be in Times New Roman. Uh, the APA uh, style guide does not uh, demand a particular font, but Times New Roman is very readable. It's kind of known as a, a standard for most kinds of documents. So it's a good thing to set up as your basic font. Times New Roman, point 12. We're going to want it double spaced. And then this format button down in the corner, we're going to make some adjustments to paragraph style. First of all, Word likes to put this eight point space after every paragraph. Uh, occasionally on papers I've seen uh, written by students, they probably either don't realize that's there or don't know how to remove it. And so that still ends up in your paper and that's that's usually incorrect in most styles. You want a double, a double spaced uh, paper with no extra spacing in there. So we'll take that off. Line spacing is double. We want a special indentation, first line, half an inch. So I believe we have everything correctly set up there. And we'll hit OK, OK. And you'll see that our body text, everything that we left in normal, is now adjusted the way we want. Next, we can go ahead and adjust the title. So I'm going to manage styles again. Title, we're going to modify that. Now, everything we're going to put in Times New Roman size 12. So we're going to adjust everything that way. Everything's going to be double spaced. Uh, the title should also be centered and bold. We're going to format the paragraph uh, to make sure it's actually centered and not off a little bit. We need to take off that special indentation. We want before and after zero. Line spacing again will make double. And uh, oh, actually, I forgot. This is, since this is the title, we're going to do something a little bit special here. Uh, this is going to be set up with 96 above, oops, too hot, too many there, 96, and then 24 after. Trust me on this. Bold center, there we go. And that gives us a title that is positioned on the page exactly where we're going to want the title of our paper on the title page there. 
I'm going to select all of this. All of this is in that subtitle style. We're going to manage that. We have a few adjustments to make. First, it's got a funny color. We want to set everything to black. That's that automatic color at the top. It's a default black. Times New Roman, size 12. Uh, oh, we want it centered, double spaced, of course. Adjust paragraphs. Let's see, no special indentation. Line spacing is doubled. Everything looks good, but there's actually one additional thing we want to adjust. If we come down to the Format tab and select Font and come over to Advanced, you'll see that the default subtitle style ha is, has uh, this expanded spacing. So we'll take that off by just selecting Normal and OK there, OK, OK. And now everything looks the way it's supposed to. Oops. There we go. That's what our first page is going to look like. Now, we set this as heading one as a placeholder, but we're actually going to make a brand new style here. So we'll come over here and collect and click new style. We want it to be based on heading one, so that part's correct. Uh, for the following paragraph, we're going to want it as normal. We're going to make a few adjustments here. We want it to be black. We're going to call it section label. That's a term that actually comes from the APA style book. That's what they call these particular headers, uh, such as the one that st starts at the top of your document or starts at the top of the reference page. So we call that a section label. Uh, again, we wanted Times New Roman, size 12. So we format paragraph. We want the special indentation off. We don't want any funky spacing on it. Line spacing should be double. I think I forgot to mention we want it centered and also bold. And there we go. Oh, that's right. I did forget one additional thing. Let's come back to manage styles. This is important. We'll modify it. Come down to paragraph, line and page breaks. So I went format paragraph, then I click over the line page breaks, and we're going to select page break before. This is what distinguishes our section labels from other level one headings, is the page break beforehand. I click OK, OK, OK. Now, I put a page break before this, and so now our first page uh, has been constructed. Since our document is up to two pages, this is a pretty good time to take care of what is known as a running head. Uh, in an APA style document, you want a header at the top that is going to contain the page number. It's also, if you are writing a professional style paper, it's also going to contain a shortened version of the title. We're not going to put that into our template because I'm specifically making a student uh, style paper here but we're going to uh, format uh, the uh, text up here correctly anyway, just in case we need that. So I'm just gonna select that there. We're gonna come back over to manage styles. You'll see it has this header style. It's hidden until we actually use it. But now that we've double clicked and opened the header, we can modify that. So we do want Times New Roman 12. We've got it double spaced again. We'll format the paragraph. We want uh, no funny spacing, double spaced. We want this uh, special indentation taken off. Also, let's format the font. And let's see, we are going to set this in all caps. And the reason for that is if you do have a shortened version of your title in the header, you want it to be in all caps. Uh, that way we never have to open the guide to remind us of that. It's already set up in our document and will happen automatically if we type in the header. Hit OK there, OK there. Now our header is set up. Again, if it's a professional paper, I would have a shortened version of the title up top, but we're not going to include that right now. Instead, I'm going to hit the tab key twice. Tab, tab. You'll see that the headers automatically have these tab stops built in, one in the center one on the right side, that's where our page number is going to go. So we go up to insert, we come down over here to 
page number. And we don't want to mess with any of this stuff. It's got some fancy options of putting page numbers in there. We don't want to deal with any of that because that will delete some of our formatting out if we uh, select any of those. Instead, we're just going to put it in current position and plane. And you'll see it drops number one in there. On the next page, we have a number two. Now, again, for student paper, we simply never have to mess uh, with the headers ever again. It contains the information that it's supposed to. The page number will change automatically each time. Next thing I'm going to set up is this body text without indentation. Uh, again, this is going to be a new style. I'm just going to call it no indent. You can call it whatever you want. I'm going to set it up to have normal as the next paragraph. Now, if you're wondering why I'm creating this, uh, it can potentially have a number of uses, although we won't really um, be getting into that in this particular demonstration. Uh, it's good to have on hand. Um, if your paper, for example, requires an abstract, although student papers usually do not, but if you're writing one that does, an abstract is not supposed to have an initial indentation. Also, although I mentioned I'm not going to get into figures and, table and tables, the uh, notes that you would put at the bottom of a figure or table is not supposed to have an initial indentation on it. So there can be a few different uh, potential uses for text with no indent. We're just going to create it. We now have it available. If we ever need it, it's right up there in our styles pane and we can select it. Now let's get down to formatting our five levels of headers. Heading one, again, we already made a section label, but we need a heading one that does not have a page break before it. So we're going to manage styles, modify. We want normal afterwards. We want black, bold, Times New Roman, size 12, double spaced, centered. Format the paragraph again. Uh, let's see, we don't want any funky spacing before, and we do not want an initial indentation. And there we go. There's a good heading one. Heading two is pretty much the same, except it's left justified. So Times New Roman, 12, bold, uh, make it black. It's already left justified but we do need to take off that initial indentation. There we go, there we go, and there it is. I'll discuss in a moment why uh, the headings are important and why you should actually use the heading styles instead of just simply say, making my text black and locating it on the left side of the page manually. Um, you, you can already see one of the reasons up here on the screen. I'll discuss this in a moment, but there are other reasons in addition to that. Let's finish making these. This uh, heading three is identi identical to heading two, except it's also in italics. Modify that. I know this does get a little bit tedious, but again, remember the most important thing is once we've done it, we never have to do it again. Um, line spacing double. I will actually show you one of the things that is set up on the headings while I have this open. We've got this paragraph box open. If we come over to line and page breaks, you'll see that the headings are automatically set to keep with next. And what that means is that, uh, say I type in a heading that appears at the bottom of the page. When I start typing the next paragraph, the heading will automatically go onto the next page along with that text. So you'll never have a break uh, that will appear never have a page break that will appear between a heading and text that follows, which will help make your papers look a little neater, a little more professional. You can, of course, set that up yourself manually, but uh, the headers are already set that way by default. I think while I was talking, I forgot to take off our uh, first line indentation. And of course, uh, that, as I said, is in italics as well, so that we have that set up. Heading four and heading five, Again, as I mentioned before, you are unlikely ever to need those, uh, but we're going to style them anyway. And I'm going to show this because it involves a little trick. Uh, it involves basically manipulating Microsoft Word in a way that um, you're probably unused to. Um, 
let's go ahead and build that style. We'll build both heading four and five. Uh, this is supposed to have an initial indentation. As I mentioned, it's supposed to also have a period after it. And the reason it has a period after it is because it's actually supposed to appear. Let me double check. Yeah, there's a little extra spacing there. It is uh, supposed to appear on the same line as the body text that follows it. I'll show you in a minute how we'll accomplish that. Because of course, by default, Word will not allow a heading and it's uh, a proceeding body text to be on the same line. But we can get Microsoft Word to allow that even though it, it doesn't by default. Heading five is exactly the same as heading four, except again, it's going to be in italics. So we'll modify that black bold italic times New Roman 12, take out any goofy spacing like that. I think the rest of that looks okay. And there we go. Now, the nice thing is if there's anything I've missed, uh, it can be fixed. Actually, I see one thing that happened here. I'm gonna modify our section label again. Uh, this will be my fault. It'll be because uh, I made the mistake of modifying the section label before I modified heading one. Again, when, a, when one style is based on another, any adjustments to the style it's based on will alter as well. That's why you want to always start by styling normal first, but I should have also styled my heading one before building my section label. Uh, but this fortunately is a relatively minor issue to solve. So that's fixed it. Okay, next I'm gonna show you how to get these on the same line. So I'm gonna select heading four and the text that follows it. And then I'm going to come up here and select view and macros. And then I'm going to type in insert separator. They always call me when I'm doing a presentation. Just ignore that because I will. Insert style separator. You'll notice I've typed it in what is called camel case. There is no space between each word, but each one does start with a capital letter. We'll hit run and you'll see what it did. It brought the uh, text up on the same line with its header. We can do the same thing down here, macros, insert style separator, run that, and there it goes. Now, this is not an option that's normally available in any of the menus or on any of the ribbons in Microsoft Word, but you can set this up so that you can uh, have a button that you can click that will do this for you. If you come over here over to file and come down to options, and then we can come to customize ribbon. And uh, we're going to need to select, it has popular commands by default, but this is not a popular one, it's an obscure one. So we're going to need all commands. And although the command is called insert style separator, it's under this list just under style separator to make it harder to find. Where are we? Where are we? A little further. There it is, style separator. Now we'll need to create a new group. You can create it under, um, I would probably put it under insert myself, like new group. We'll see, it'll add that. And then we can, again, come back and select, where did it go? Style separator, come on. Style, style, style separator, there we are. We can add that to the new group. Hit OK, and then you'll see, um, well, I have it over here. I already have um, a couple of uh, unusual options that I have uh, customized into Microsoft Word, but you'll see uh, it just added this uh, just now. So by adding that to your ribbon, you can um, potentially do this with any headings, either in APA style or for any other reason you might have. Uh, to make two different styles appear on the same line that normally would not. All right, we're going to set up our block quotation 
format that. Modify. Make sure that's on automatic. I think it actually has it on a grayed out font. We don't want it in italics. We want it left justified. Times New Roman 12 is correct. Come to paragraph. We actually want to take off our first line indentation. And we do want a left indentation, but only half an inch. And we don't want anything on the right. We also need to take off any funny spacing there. Line spacing should still be double. This is, uh, oh, one additional thing I'm going to do. For the following paragraph, select intense quote. What I'm setting up here is uh, kind of a bit of a trick that will make Word uh, automatically um, adjust the paragraphs of our quotes correctly if they run to more than one paragraph. So we'll hit OK on that, OK on that. Now, the way a block quotation works, again, if you quote anything that uh, runs over 40 words, you set it in a block quotation. The entirety of the block quotation, as you can see on my ruler up here, is set off a half, a half inch. The entire thing is indented half an inch. Now, if you quote a source that runs uh, more than one paragraph, the additional paragraph should have an additional first line indentation of another half inch, meaning uh, the, the second paragraph of the block quotation has a one inch ind indentation. We're going to make Word create that automatically for us because we have the block quotation made. It will automatically switch to this intense quote style if it runs to a sec, uh, you know, when we hit enter to create a second paragraph. So we're going to modify that. And we're going to make that in automatic again, Times New Roman 12, take off the funny italics, left justified, double spacing is correct. Um, style for following paragraph. And I'm just going to set it as intense quote again. You can leave it as normal if you prefer. Paragraph adjustment. Again, we want uh, right side should be 0.5 inch. We do want a first line of an additional half inch. Oh, I have that wrong. Left, we want left. Right, we take off. There we go. Any weird spacing needs to come out. And there's one other thing that needs to come out, and that is obviously these lines that are above and below it. So that is under borders. We just select none. And there we go. Now we have a paragraph that will automatically indent if we have a second paragraph following our block quotation. Basically, what you could do, quote your source, finish typing your quote. I type in another paragraph, so forth and so on. And then once I'm done with the block quote, I can just come up here and select normal. And I'm ready to write my next quotation that way. Um, if you are quoting a source that's going to run to two paragraphs in your block quote, in most cases, you should probably consider quoting less material. But if you ever do need to quote uh, multiple paragraphs of anything, this is now set up again to have uh, everything happen automatically for you. One final thing, references needs to be in that uh, section label style that we've already created. Where's my section label? Where's my section label? There it is, section label. So we just select section label up here. It automatically creates it. So it puts it on another page as it's supposed to. And then finally, our bibliographic entry. This is very much like normal style with one major difference. And that is, one thing I should need to adjust is, oh, hold on, my bad. Let's try that one more time. We need to create a new style, not modify the style. We're going to call it bibliographic entry. Following paragraph, if there is one, is also going to be a bibliographic entry. Format our paragraph. Instead of first line, we want a hanging indentation. And that is the only difference uh, from our normal font. 
Now, again, as I said before, this takes a little while to set up, but now that we've set this up, uh, we never have to do it again. We can save this to our computer and it will be available anytime we need to type uh, a document in APA style. Now, you may have already noticed I have the navigation pane open over here. If you want to bring that up on your own version of Word, uh, just hit Control F. That's the short key for that. You can check on the, under the headings tab. You'll see that it is automatically building an outline of the paper for me, and I can navigate around the paper by selecting each of those headings. Uh, this will be useful to you as you're editing your paper. Again, anybody who has uh, any kind of accessibility needs, such as somebody who needs to use a screen reader or someone who may not be able to handle a mouse, uh, this kind of navigation also um, makes that much easier for that individual. These, uh, these are known as, this is known as semantic structure. Uh, having semantic headings as opposed to ones that you have just styled manually using fonts and paragraphs um, is just good uh, document design. And so this also, again, as I mentioned, having these styles set up on the back end also makes your files uh, much smaller. So even though it takes a little initial time, in the end, this is going to be an improvement of your document. It's going to guarantee that you have a correctly formatted paper every time. And uh, it's, it's also just a better structured document all around. Now, to make sure this is always available, we want to save it in a particular way. Come over to File, select Save As. It doesn't really matter what we choose for our folder. I'm just going to choose a desktop because it's actually going to automatically put it in a particular place. Under Save As Type, open up Let's see, where is it? Word template, and you see it's going to automatically save it in this custom office templates folder. And you can call it whatever you like. Uh, APA style paper is a good idea. You'll notice I've done this before, so I already have a few versions. I'll call this one three. It's going to save this for us in such a way that now if I want to create a new document, you will see that I have, uh, I have this saved as a format type. I can select that and it will bring up the template I've just created. All the styles are up there in the styles pane. Anytime I need anything in particular, I don't have to look it up in the book. I can just be like, uh, how did I do a heading three? Oh yeah, it doesn't matter how I did it because I can just select it right there and boom, my text is automatically styled as a heading three. If I need to revert things back to the standard font, all I have to do is select normal, boom, they're back to normal paragraphs, so forth and so on. I can adjust my whole document this way simply uh, using the elements that I've already created and that are available to me up in that styles pane. So there you go, there's the basics of creating a document. I want to discuss a few other things. One is in-text citations. There's a lot of details about how to do proper in-text citations that are in your APA style guide. I'm only going to give a few details here. Let us say that you quoted some text out of another source. You would normally put it in quotation marks, again, unless it runs to over 40 words. And then you have what's called a parenthetical citation. These are the basic elements, page number, year of public, or excuse me, the last name of the author or authors, page number, uh, date, year of publication, and then page numbers. One thing I do want to point out that I've seen sometimes in student papers is that your final punctuation mark goes after the parentheses. This is different from normally when you're, say, writing dialogue in a work of fiction of course, normally you would have the final punctuation uh, within the quotation mark. But the reason for this, there is actually a logic behind it. The citation itself is not part of the quotation, but it is part of the sentence. And that's why the citation goes before the final punctuation mark. That's a little different with the aforementioned block quotations. Let's uh, say that we have a quotation that runs to more than 40 words. We're going to remember style that in our quote style. 
Then at the end of the quotation, you put the citation. By itself. Again, it's not part of the text that's actually quoted. So it is set off and then there's no final punctuation that comes after it. Another question I've gotten sometimes because a lot of times you're likely to cite uh, web resources that don't have page numbers. What do you do when you have a direct quotation and no page number? APA style allows you to use either paragraph numbers. You could count the paragraphs down the screen, although in most cases, web resources will actually have uh, section labels uh, above the different sections of the page. So you could actually be like, and actually use the title of the section and just type section after it. Um, if you're looking at a resource that does not have an individual author, most of the times you would use the name of an organization that produced it as the author. So you might produce um, a citation that looks something like that. A bit long and awkward, but it is a correct APA citation. I do want to bring up one additional document that I've created. And again, there should be a link to that in the description at the bottom of this video. This is a cheat sheet I've created that contains examples with explanations of some of the most common types of sources you are likely to cite. Um, probably in most of your uh, student papers, the site you will, the type of citation you will make most often is going to be for a journal article. There's a few little tripping points, a little a few eccentricities of APA style that I want to point out here. First of all, of course, you have the author's name written in last name and then first initials order. That one's not too difficult to figure out. Followed, of course, by year of publication in parentheses. Now, one part that starts to get students is that the title of the article itself is written in what we call sentence case. A sentence case means that only the first letter is capitalized like in a sentence. And then also a first letter that comes after a colon. This is... Um, you know, different style guides will, will differ on whether the first word after a colon should be capitalized. In APA style, they should be. And so that carries over into titles as well. Uh, capitalize the first word, capitalize the first word after the colon. And then, of course, any proper nouns that might show up in the title, like if this was, for example, you know, in Germany or something like that. Obviously, uh, proper nouns should be capitalized as well. But uh, so first word, first word after colon, proper nouns. That's all you capitalize in the article title. For whatever reason, the title of the journal this comes out of is actually written in title case, meaning that all the important words in the title are capitalized. So we see here psychological review, the R in review is capitalized as well. The journal title should, of course, be in italics. That's standard for things like books, journals, any longer works, as you probably already know, are generally italicized. But one of the kind of goofy eccentricities of APA style is that the volume number is also italicized, but not the issue number. You write the volume number in italics, and then immediately following it with no space is the issue number in uh, in regular font and in parentheses. Now, before we go on, uh, for those of you who don't know, let me explain what exactly is a volume and an issue. Um, typically, the volume number is by year. So if this is according to the standard way this is done, this would be uh, the 126th year the psychological review has been published. And then this would be the first issue published in that particular year. Now, they're called volumes, and in fact, in the library, they are, after a, a full volume's worth is collected, are actually bound together in a physical volume, a big, thick book that contains all the issues for that particular year. So if somebody were getting psychological review at the library, they would walk to the shelf where it's housed, they would pick up volume 126, open it to the first issue and to the first page, and they would have this article. Even though citations can be a little hard to parse when you're not used to them, uh, there is actually a logic to them. The information that they contain tells you where to find this source. 
So if somebody's looking for that and he's like, oh yeah, it's volume 126, I can open it to the first issue. And there's the article that I'm looking for. So they can follow up on the research uh, that you've done, follow up on the research that, that uh, any academic writer has done because it will have a reference list like this at the end of his work. And that's why citing sources is so important. And so other people can follow up. So other people can check your references, see if you've represented the source accurately, or just you know, continue to do uh, his own research using the sources that you found. So the other final thing that often goes on a lot of articles is going to be a DOI or sometimes a URL. Only use a regular URL if the source is available on the open web. If you get it out of a database, like a library database that is the library has to a subscription, don't include that at the end of the article because that's not something that's really readily available to other researchers. However, if you have a DOI, that stands for Digital Object Identifier, always include that in possible. And a DOI is also preferable to a URL. If you have both, use the DOI instead. Uh, a DOI is designed in such a way that regardless of what happens to that article, if it moves around the web, the DOI will always point to it. I don't know why that works, but it apparently does. And so do use that and you will notice there's no final punctuation mark at the end of the DOI. And that is because, watch what happens here, I put a period at the end, you'll notice it's trying to hyperlink my period. Um, the reason that there's no final punctuation marks at the end of a DOI or a URL in APA style is to keep hyperlinks basically from getting messed up. Or if somebody's copying and pasting the address, they might ac accidentally paste the final punctuation mark in, and then you know the web browser will go to a, a, you know, a 404 error. So no final punctuation at the end there. Second type of resource you're likely to cite is a book. This is probably the simplest thing to cite in APA style. Name, year, title, sentence case again, but italicized because it's a longer work. Any addition information, like if it's an addition other than the first, you put in second or third or whatever it is, followed by ED period, and then the publisher. If there's multiple publishers, you can just write them all together, separated by semicolons. Uh, reasonably simple and elegant. Some books will also have a DOI. Um, I can't recall ever personally having encountered that in the wild, but it does exist. So if there's DOI, include that too, just as you would with an article. Basically, anytime you have a DOI, include it in the citation. Now, the, another thing you're likely to cite a lot of, and this is where it starts getting a little bit more complex. Uh, I recommend having this cheat sheet on hand just because personally, I always have to look this up. Whenever I cite an article or a chapter uh, by an individual within a book that is a collection of chapters by uh, a lot of different people, I always have to look up how to do it. Names of the author, year, title of the particular chapter, just as if it's a journal article. But then you type in in, and then the name of the editor of the book followed by ED with a capital E, which in this case stands for editor rather than edition. And then a comma and the title of the book again in sentence case. And then that's followed in parentheses by any edition information plus the page numbers and then the publisher. Again, not really complicated. And again, all the information makes sense so somebody else could find this book and read that chapter. But I always forget the exact order of elements, so I always have to look that up. That's probably the one most commonly I have to refresh in my memory. Two other things increasingly common now are blog posts and web page or online news article. Now, I do not know why APA style divides these things up the, the way they have. Sometimes I think it can be very difficult to tell the difference between a blog post and an online news article or between a blog post and a web page. Nonetheless, do your best. APA style does make a distinction here. Pretty much the only difference between the two, and this is really kind of odd, the only difference between the two is what is italicized. In a blog post, you take the title of the post as if it's like the title of an article. You write it in sentence case with, without italicizing it, and then italicize 
the name of the blog, again, written in title case, similar to a journal, and then, of course, the web address. For a web page or an online news article, you do it the other way. Now, I don't know why an online news article would not be written like an article out of a journal or magazine, but it's not. And again, we have no control over that. APA is weird sometimes, but we just basically have to roll with its eccentricities because there's nothing we can do about it. It's not worth complaining about. For a web page or an online news article, you italicize the name of the article itself, followed by the name of the website written in title case, but not italicized. Have trouble remembering that? Keep my cheat sheet on hand, and then you'll, then you'll be able to remember it. So I have a couple of examples there of a website and news article. And then finally, something else is probably going to come up increasingly these days is going to be uh, something like a streaming video. This is how you do that. Uh, name the streaming service at the end, similar to a website. It's actually very similar uh, to uh, a, web, a website or online news article. One of the major differences is that you include in brackets here the type of media that is a video. Something else that uh, oftentimes with streaming videos, and this may come up with other websites, you may have somebody who goes by a, a, a handle online that's different from the person's actual name. If possible, if both are available, include the handle in brackets and then the real name is the author's name out to the side. If you don't have the actual name, all you have is the handle, just treat the handle as if it's the person's name, but don't reverse the order. Like, let's say we didn't know that uh, Fogarty was the grammar girl, we would just write it like this, grammar girl. We wouldn't put, we wouldn't put girl comma G. That would be incorrect because this is obviously not a real person's name. Uh, one other thing I should note, you'll notice that for some of the resources up here, in addition to the publication year, I've included month and day. You should do this for basically anything besides a journal or book, if it's available. Um, if you have a magazine, you may have, uh, magazines may be published monthly, so you should include uh, the month in here. A lot of blog posts, you know, they're going to have the month, day, year, either built into the URL itself or uh, usually written possibly with the author's byline. Include all that information. Blog posts tend to be irregular, so you want the exact date if possible. Same thing with web pages, streaming video, and, and also magazines or, or newspapers. Uh, basically anything except a book and a journal. Books and academic journals, you need the year of publication. Anything else, all the date information that is available include in there. And it's year, comma, month, and day. There's a lot of other things we could potentially talk about, but what we've done here will definitely get you started. Take the AP, APA template that you've constructed, use that as your starting point for all APA papers that you write from now on, and you have peace of mind that you have a correctly formatted paper. Take this cheat sheet, print it out, Keep it next to you while you are writing your citations, and you will have a, the structure there for the most common types of citations. Obviously, there's a lot of other documents you could potentially cite. For that, do refer to your APA manual. Thank you for joining me for this particular video. I hope this has been helpful, instructive, that possibly you've learned a few things about how to manage your word processor, as well about how to write an APA style. Uh, thank you, and I'll see you next time.